Chapter 11 Looking at the Raws again, I realize that Dracosaurus should actually be Dragosaurus, so I will be changing the term to that. Sure does make a lot more sense, since they were named after dragons. Teehee? The dwarves always found the existence known as to be extremely interesting. The dwarves were currently the oldest species amongst all living creatures. Their appearance had not changed for 4.6 billion years, and their head, Sahela, had continued to live throughout those 4.6 billion years. However, lately the beings known as humans, which appeared in the stories that their creator, Mount Dragonens, had told them about when speaking of his previous world, which was even older than dwarves themselves, had started to strut around the earth. With the character found in the world's oldest stories suddenly appearing as one of the newest living beings on earth and walking around on it, there's no way it wouldn't attract their curiosity. The dwarves loved high temperature environments and lived in stone towns created solely near volcanoes or underground collections of magma. They would, on rare occasions, make towns above ground. If they used the dragon crystals, then they had no trouble making stone buildings that were enveloped in scorching air that made it easier for them to live. They would always, without fail, make such towns above ground near where the humans dwelled. As for why they went out of their way to produce artificial heat so that they could live above ground, it was of course so they could interact with humans. The dwarves primarily made light of humans and just found them to be interesting wild animals that resembled them. It was only natural. Humans had to breathe or they would die. They had to drink water or they would die. And if their body caught on fire, they would die for some reason. They would die for some hard to understand reason if they caught a cold. And if a lot of the red water that flowed within their bodies was spilled out, they would die. They were more clumsy, slower, and weaker than dwarves. If they managed to live for 50 years, they'd be considered seniors. It was a tenth of a dwarf's lifespan. Asking them to communicate with humans as equals would be unreasonable like this. Mount. Dragon ends judged the dwarves who built and lived in towns near human dwellings to be like those who loved cats so much they went to live on the cat island. While the dwarves were very interested in humans, it was extremely rare for them to build a deep relationship with them. They didn't understand the same language. Since their vocal cords were different, it was difficult to learn each other's languages, even if they tried. And for the most part, when they tried to help humans who were injured and were crying because they couldn't move, or when they picked up humans who had been thrown away, they'd make mistakes in doing so and accidentally kill them. On the human side, they feared this race that was similar to themselves, yet was completely different. Just a single one of these dwarves that, at a glance, looked like old men who were as small as a human child, was capable of destroying their whole family. They were existences even more frightening than mammoths or saber-toothed tigers. They were also frightened of the Dragosauruses the dwarves rode. The well-disciplined Dragosaurus were sensitive and could detect the humans that creeped up on them. If the humans tried to touch them, they'd bite the humans with their sharp fangs. The dwarves were kind to humans, but that kindness was littered with danger, like a large animal that would inadvertently trample small animals. That is why contact between the two species was left at the level of occasional teasing. Like how you'd feed a wild animal you happened to meet and pet it, the dwarves also teased the humans. Through that teasing, the dwarves gave humans fire on a whim, taught them their crafts, and before long they had mastered that skill. Fire gave humans light and warmth, and that led to the creation of civil baptization. The greatest gain from fire was that it enabled them to increase their food sources. It could detoxify food with poison, denature the proteins of tough and hard-to-digest meats, converting them into soft barbecued meat. In order to cook better, they created tools for cooking, such as stone stoves and knives. The tools, or their assets, in other words, increased. Sharp knives and light but durable earthenware, as well as fine fur clothes held great value. And then, as the humans started to make various tools by themselves, they realized the value of the high-grade treasures that the dwarves possessed, and started to eye them. That was the beginning of the disputes. To humans, 
infiltrating dwarven towns to steal treasure was the same as taking eggs from bird nests or taking bones from a mammoth graveyard. The dwarven towns did not have food, but they had plenty of beautiful, sturdy, easy to use, and useful tools. The dazzling metals and jewels fascinated the humans. The dwarves were people of the mountain, and the treasure that they dug up, refined, and polished from underground was like a possession of the mountain. The humans tried to steal that. The dwarves were not completely defenseless, and even if they aimed to come when the dwarves were away, generally the treasure was protected by a dragon, the Dragosaurus. The humans tried to use stone spears and bows to defeat them, but it was usually impossible. They were no opponent to the Dragosaurus. The Dragosauruses were one of the remaining dinosaurs surviving, and they possessed a strong skeleton, scales, and muscles. As a result of being domesticated by dwarves for over a hundred million years, they had also become resistant to fire as well. All the weapons of primitive humans completely bounced off of them, and they would bite the thieves to death. However, unexpectedly there were times when the thieves succeeded, like when the dwarves were out and the Dragosaurus was asleep, or if the Dragosaurus was old and weak, or they accidentally managed to crush its eyes and took the opportunity while it was writhing in agony. When they did that, the returns were enormous, and the human obtained an amazing fortune. The dwarven treasure and dragon killing gave them a legendary level of honor. It would become a tale amongst their tribe and be handed down through the generations, extolled for a long time through murals and mementos. On the other hand, the dwarves held their heads at Humanchen that obtained the habit of stealing. No matter how much they drove them off, they'd come back again. If they went to take back that which had been stolen, then it'd turn into a huge incident as though their tribe was going to be destroyed from the attack of a calamitous beast. In addition, they'd arbitrarily settle down in vacant houses in the town or snatch the feed meant for the Dragosauruses. Eventually, the dwarves became fed up with trying to drive them off or recover the stolen items and abandoned the towns above ground, returning to the underground. The same things happened all across the earth, and with the arrival of the Ice Age as well, it was only a few tens of thousands of years before the dwarves completely disappeared off the surface of the earth. Only faint traces of the dwarves were left through murals and their treasure, as well as legends that continued to be passed down. A long time passed, and they were completely forgotten until the time when humans developed to mine for ore and started to dig deep into the earth. Chapter 12 A young mermaid girl, Ninian, was famous as an eccentric amongst her people. She took up residence at the bottom of the largest lake on the British Isles, Loch Lomond, and lived in a huge shell and pearl house. It was rare amongst the mermaids who inhabited the ocean. As the mermaids obtained their life energy from the ocean, they would become weaker the further from the ocean they were. Loch Lomond was connected to the ocean by means of a river and possessed plenty of volume, so mermaids could somehow manage to survive on the energy they obtained there, but even so, it would force them into a rather constrained life. Ninian, who was fond of living in such a place, was none other than an eccentric. Ninian worked hard to learn the human's language, English, and could speak to the humans that came to the lake. As the generations of local people passed, from their grandfather's age to becoming grandfathers themselves, Ninian became known as the Lady of the Lake and was honored, even as they feared her. The Lady of the Lake often acted as a mediator between the elves and humans when they ended up confronting each other over the territorial rights of the forest. She was a welcome, mysterious existence that cheerfully lent her wisdom to the troubled humans. The events of a certain day, they once again came to consult the Lady of Loch Lomond. A handsome knight brought a single valet with him and borrowed a small boat from the citizens that lived by the lakeshore, rowing into the lake. A faint mist covered the lake, and at times fish would jump up, producing splashing noises in the otherwise quiet environment. After advancing to the middle of the lake, the knight stood up and shouted with a loud voice, Beautiful Lady of the Lake, Ninian, I offer you a present. Answer the voice of this mortal. Answering his charmingly ancient-styled call, air bubbles rose close to the small boat, and the Lady of the Lake 
popped her head out of the water's surface. The knight did not appear perturbed, but the valet who was seeing the Lady of the Lake for the first time fell on his backside in amazement. The Lady of the Lake had deep blue hair that reminded one of the ocean, characteristic of mermaids, and wore a silver tiara that had a large red jewel embedded in it. Pale, white skin could be seen through her light, smooth robe. The valet was surprised at seeing a lady who seemed like nobility appearing so suddenly from the middle of the lake, and after noticing that the bottom half of her bottom was like that of a fish's, he was surprised yet again. Hearing about it and seeing it in person were two completely different experiences. Arthur shrugged his shoulders in disappointment at his valet's unsightly state and then kneeled to hand over his present, a small horse ornament created by a mason. The Lady of the Lake happily received it and peered at Arthur's face, tilting her head. Oh, aren't you, Arthur? You suddenly grew bigger. What's wrong? Are you ill? Ninian, to humans, twenty years is far longer than you think it is. I've already grown to adulthood. Seeing the Lady of the Lake grasp the edge of the small boat while saying that in a worried manner, Arthur gave a wry smile, being the fearless man he was. When he had met her before, Arthur was still a very young boy. After twenty years passed, Arthur had become the King of Britain, but it seemed that the Lady of the Lake hadn't changed at all, even after the passing of twenty years. The Lady of the Lake spoke to him open-heartedly, like a village woman exchanging idle gossip. I've heard rumors about you. You pulled out the sword of the Chosen One and became Britain's king, right? That's amazing. A king can have their subordinates do anything for them, right? Not necessarily. Things are far more troublesome compared to the past. Is that so? Despite that, you still became king? How weird. How do mermaids decide on their king? Though we have a head, we don't have a king. But let's see. If we were to decide on a king, then I think that Mount Gro, Agonens, would be the one to decide. So a mountain would decide? A mountain decides, even though you live in the ocean. That feels a bit strange. After enjoying chatting for a short while as a lead-in, Arthur then went to the main topic. Using his hand to give the signal, the valet suddenly returned to his senses and passed over a cloth bundle. Then, Arthur untied the string tying the bundle and took out the broken sword inside of it, showing it to the Lady of the Lake. This is the previously mentioned Sword of the Chosen One, Caliburn. Something a little stupid happened, causing it to break. We need a substitute sword for it, but if a king is going to have another sword that chooses the king made, then he can't possibly just use any blacksmith to do so. Do you have any good swords? Hmm, well, wait for a bit. After taking the broken sword and examining it closely, the Lady of the Lake sunk to the bottom of the lake while still holding the sword. As they waited for the Lady of the Lake, the valet that had been waiting silently offered his advice to Arthur. My king, is it truly all right to leave such an important sword to such a strange person? Sir Bedivere, that would be like doubting the true meaning of the earth and skies. If you cannot believe in her, then nothing living on this land is worthy of belief. As Arthur spoke far too clearly, Bedivere also withdrew. After a little while, bubbles once again formed on the surface of the lake, and the Lady of the Lake appeared. She did not carry the broken sword, but presented to Arthur a magnificent sword that shone despite the surrounding mist. Receiving it as he displayed his admiration, Arthur could distinctly feel a mysterious power from the sword. It's a sword forged by dwarves in the town of Avalon. Since it's made from an alloy that has a dragon crystal mixed into it, there shouldn't be any worries about it breaking as long as you're using it in the human world. Will that work? Of course, there is no sword of greater repute than this. That's good, but once you're done using it, remember to return it. It's an important sword that I used for my coming-of-age ceremony. Everyone laughed and said it was weird that it wasn't a trident, but as expected, I... Mm. <sighs> it's fine, even if you need to have someone come to return it in your stead, Arthur, so please don't forget. I swear on my honor as a knight that I will definitely return it. Incidentally, what is the engraving on this sword? There appear to be words on the handle, but I can't read it. The Lady of the Lake smiled and answered, It's Excalibur. Chapter 13 According to the mythology Kamuyukara of the Ainu people, Upashikamui, 
god of snow, came from the country of gods by riding an ice flow. Upashikami takes on the form of a huge bipedal gray wolf. His stature is taller than that of any large man, and though his fur is soft, it cannot be penetrated by any arrow. Since he speaks the language of the gods, he cannot speak Ainu words, but if you speak to him sincerely, then he will listen well. Since Upashikamui is the god of snow, he cannot live without ice and snow. During the warm seasons when ice and snow disappear, he is terribly weakened. That is why when Upashikamui comes to an Ainu village, Kotan, the whole village will work to create an ice house and will courteously invite him to live there. When ice and snow piled up on the ground, they'd squeeze it into holes in ground, caves, and large warehouses built in the shade so that not all of the ice and snow would disappear in the summer. By devoting their hearts to entertain him, Upashikamui will give gifts in return during the winter. Every day, even during blizzards, he would go out to hunt and would without fail bring back some game to give to them. Villages where Upashikamui was would never starve in the winter. Even so, when the earth and gods grew angry, there were winters when not even Upashikamui could obtain any prey. During such helpless years, all the men from the villages Koten in the vicinity would gather, recite a spell that had been decided upon since ancient times, and challenge Upashikamui. Upashikamui's fur could repel any sort of sword or arrow. All poisons were also ineffective against him. That is why, in order to win, they would all challenge him at once barehanded, as there was no other way to take him down head-on. If there was a true hero amongst Upashikamui's challengers, then he'd leave his own flesh behind upon losing, and his soul would return to the world of gods. Upashikamui's meat was the only food that the Ainu were allowed to eat from the land of gods, and those who ate it would be able to fill their bellies with ice and snow like Upashikamui. That is why a village where Upashikamui stayed would never starve in the winter. In addition, the elves could interpret Upashikamui's words as a special favor. If there was something that Upashikamui absolutely had to say to the Ainu, the elves would act as his mouthpiece. In this manner, the elves became those who could communicate with the gods, Kamui. So if they came across an elf in the forest, the Ainu would have to bow politely, and when they entered elven towns, they had to take special care to act courteously. By doing so, the elves would help them during epidemics or catastrophes in return. Now then, over time the mortal Ainu children turned into old men, and eventually their grandchildren would also become old men. As the months and years passed, Upashikamui, who lived in the village, would start to miss his fellows. Every night he would howl towards the moon, and gradually he would become more bad-tempered. When this happened, Upashikamui had to be sent to a suitable location before he became an evil god that kills people. The Ainu would guide Upashikamui to a snowy mountain, Kamui Mintara. This was a prestigious journey called the Uosamante, Howling Sendoff. Upashikamui ate ice and snow and showed respect to high mountains. The harpies were also there so he wouldn't be bored. As such, the snowy mountains were suitable as a final destination for the journey. After safely delivering Upashikamui to the snow-capped peak of the snowy mountain, completing the Uosamante, Upashikamui would share the claws from his body. Upashikamui's claws were the only weapon from the country of gods that the Ainu were permitted to use. The claws were so sharp that even without being polished, they could easily split iron apart. If you struck them together, you'd be able to call upon a chilly wave even in the midsummer. Upashikamui, who can perform such miracles and bestow such weapons, can be said to be the close, as Kamui that connects the gods and the Ainu. Keicho era year 9 Ando Kanesu, I see. It was currently the Edo period. The Ainu had a castle of a feudal lord in the Matsumai domain. Having given a large monetary donation in order to be permitted to utilize the library, the depraved monk, a clergyman who violated the rules of the religion he was a member of, Kuishinbo nodded once before closing an old book. The details of the memorandum regarding folklore between the Ainu and Kamui, written by a military commander from that time, had become immensely useful as a reference. Recently, the Edo shogunate had found their hands being burned by the warriors of the aborigines of the Matsumai domain, the Ainu, when trying to reclaim the Ainu wastelands and develop it. If it was just the elves, 
who could be found in any place that can be called a forest, being stingy about each and every tree being cut down, then there wasn't any change from what could be found in their home country. However, the Ainu were even more radical than the elves when displaying their opposition. Upon realizing that they were being cheated in the business transactions and negotiations, they absolutely would not stand down until they had received a sufficient apology. Even if you tried to reconcile with them by giving a large amount of money and treasure, they would see it as an affront and would fly into a rage. The hot-blooded samurai that had flowed into the Matsume domain during the Warring States period often conflicted with the Ainu warriors, but they had a defeat for every conflict that occurred. The claws that the Ainu warriors used would break their katanas like toothpicks, and they easily sliced up armor that wouldn't even allow arrows to pass through. But it was indeed understandable why the samurai were no match for them if the Ainu's weapons were bestowed upon them by a god. Even if they were the brave samurai of the Matsumai domain, as expected, they hadn't received weapons from any gods or Buddha. However, what caught the eye of the depraved monk Quishinbo in the archives wasn't that. Quishinbo's imagination was struck. You could actually eat Upashikamui. Quishinbo had conquered all sorts of foods. He had entered priesthood in order to eat the vegetarian cuisines of monks and had become a depraved monk after being excommunicated for eating meat despite it being prohibited. The priest's garb was quite convenient as it could be used to obtain trust wherever he traveled just by wearing it. And the ultimate meal that Quishinbo sought out in the northern lands was Upashikamui's meat. He had heard the idle gossip about the aborigines that said they ate the meat of a god and could not resist making the long journey. As a result, there had been some worth in doing so. Afterwards, the depraved monk, whose name had become the origin of the word Quishinbo, glutton, took the proof of the information he had obtained and set forth on a trip even further north in high spirits. Chapter 14 During the era of pioneering in the West, in the land of America, harpies were made into targets by those taking on the appearance of gunmen. Originally, Christianity persecuted the harpies. They saw them as ugly imitations of angels and made them out to be underlings of the devil that tried to cheat humans. They were thought of as ominous harbingers of calamity that summoned raging storms and tornadoes. Sailors, in particular, were so afraid of the harpies that brought storms with them that they'd have a heart attack just from the sight of them. The persistent attacks from the deeply superstitious humans caused the harpies to mostly disappear from the eyes of the Christian church by the 15th century. But the new continent was different. As long as you looked up at the sky, you were bound to see at least one of them. A bounty was placed on the harpies, and all of the gunmen tried to hunt and shoot them down in order to bring up their reputations. As harpies possessed the ability to manipulate the wind, a sharp sense of intuition, and they could fly quickly in the sky, it was not easy to hit them with a bullet. A trend was started in the new continent where being able to take down a harpy for the first time was a sign that you could be counted as a first-class gunman. Amongst the gunmen whose names were well known, there was not a single one that didn't have any experience in hunting a harpy. And then in the West appeared rumors of a dreadful divine gunman who would challenge such renowned gunmen, bringing defeat to every single one of them. That gunman was Calamity Hal Jane, a famed female gunman who represented the age of pioneering in the West. She was a gunman that was active in the latter half of the 19th century, and there was an abundance of odd anecdotes about her. The first was that she apparently did not remember her own birthday. After saying to a certain opponent that, I just turned 20 years old, the very next day at a bar she said something crazy like, Actually, I've lived for several hundred million years. There was also a funny story about her insisting, I'm actually still three years old, in order to cheat a missionary who was distributing candy to children. The harpy's harp that Jane carried with her was a beautiful piece. Dragon crystals are a classic example of the most supreme jewels, and this magnificent article used them freely to join the harp together through some unknown technique. Only 15 of the villains who tried to steal this harp from her 
remained in the records, and all of them were shot to death. Since it was that great of an item, there was no way it wouldn't be gossiped about if it were traded. However, there was no such rumors, so it was believed that Calamity Hal Jane shot a harpy to death and stole it herself. However, Jane absolutely hated the shooting and killing of harpies. Rather, it could be said that she loved harpies. The person herself repeatedly stated that the reason why she had challenged all those gunmen that killed harpies to a duel and shot them to death was because she had a personal grudge with them. In addition, over the course of her active period, between the years of 1850 to 1900, Jane always had the appearance of a young girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. This was evident from several pictures that existed of her. At the time, it was apparently said that because she had shot an alchemist to death and stolen their philosopher's stone, she became ageless. The person herself would regularly change how she introduced herself, saying, I am Calamity Hal Jane's daughter. I'm her granddaughter. I'm the person herself. While the truth may have been like that, the Jane that called herself Jane's daughter seemed to speak of matters that only Jane herself should have known in a nostalgic manner. Or at least, there were a number of anecdotes regarding such situations, though they could not be completely trusted to be true. In the years following her active period, Jane, or the women who said they were Jane's blood relatives that look, d just like her, had a bounty placed on her and was chased around due to it. She openly defended the harpies whom Christianity had declared to be demons and shot skilled gunmen to death one after the other. Such barbaric acts were seen as intolerable. All of Jane's pursuers were completely repelled. Jane was generous, and since she was a kind and lovely young maiden to anyone other than the gunmen, those with ulterior motives, and those who owed her a debt of gratitude, helped her escape. Thus, Jane managed to dodge the pursuit from the authorities over the course of 18 years. According to a number of letters exchanged with the woman who is thought to be Jane, she had been enjoying this grand escape drama that went through all of the states in America. However, apparently in the end, the authorities managed to corner Jane and get rid of her. It was, apparently. So because on November 3, 1900, the place where Jane was cornered in Salt Lake City was flattened by a sudden giant tornado. Whether it be the house, the people, or the livestock, not a single one of them was left behind. Ever since the annihilation of Salt Lake City, Calamity Hal Jane disappeared. The authorities deemed her as dead due to the tornado, and the wanted posters that had been posted for 18 long years were finally taken down. Together with Jane, the gunmen also disappeared, as did the harpies. They were simply being hunted down and as such stopped appearing in front of humans. They became rare existences that could seldomly be seen flying inside high-altitude clouds during large stormy days where bullets cannot physically reach them. By the 21st century, the harpies were only confirmed to be found in ravines that had strong winds blowing through them or high mountains without human settlements. Alternatively, they were found in lands such as Patagonia, where there were strong winds present all year round. As expected, the harpy could be said to be the symbol that made up the era of pioneering in the West. Chapter 15 Just one more chapter, and this series will be finished. Confrontations between elves and humans regarding the forest had continued since the dawn of history without pause. In every age, no matter which region it was, as long as there was a forest, there were elves. The elves would become angry at the humans who cleared the forest in the area they were in, and in turn caused trees to encroach on the human's town for seven days and nights, completely transforming it into a forest. If the humans burned the elves' forest in retaliation to that, the elves would then turn the humans into fertilizer for the forest. While it was rare for the conflicts to grow that violent, it was certain that the relationship between humans and elves as a species was more inclined towards conflict as opposed to coexistence. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any way to explain the reason as to why in the languages of countries all over the world they shared the word elf as a common curse. One of the reasons why the conflict had hardly ever evolved into a war was thanks to the elves' management of the forest. The forests where elves existed were plentiful. The forests that didn't have elves were meager. 
If an adult elf used a spell with their staff, they could fertilize the land and control plants. That is why an elf's forest rarely had a poor crop. It always had a plentiful harvest, and the animals that ate that harvest would in turn become plentiful as well. To elves, humans were one of the animals in nature, and as such, they would not say anything if they took a portion of the forest's blessing. The elves would only get mad when the forest was cut down on a large scale for lumber or in order to expand the arable land. The humans would also, naturally, become enraged when the land that they had worked so hard to cultivate was turned back into a forest by the elves. Even while the humans acknowledged that the elves made forests more plentiful, a large number of them thought of the elves as suspicious nuisances. The fighting spirit of the elves were generally weaker than that of the humans during confrontations over the forest, and as such would usually end with them taking a step back and compromising. As such, the sphere of human activity gradually expanded. Now then, this was an event during the spring of year 20 of the Showa era. Japan was right in the midst of the Pacific War, and was hastening the evacuation of its capital city, Tokyo. With the memories and scars of the large-scale air raids that attacked Tokyo still fresh, an 11-year-old boy, Ashida Kenjiro, just barely managed to escape from a fire caused by an incendiary bomb. Even while he felt a sense of displeasure from having been forced to the countryside, he felt relief from the fact that the fear of having his home set aflame had been diminished. Kenjiro's older brother, Kenichiro, became a soldier and had gone to the front lines to battle for the sake of the country. Kenjiro had to live properly in order not to shame his brother's name. It was at the countryside village where Kenjiro had been evacuated that he saw an elf in the flesh for the first time. The outskirts of Tokyo that were being developed did not have any elves. The elves that he had seen in monochrome photos and paintings were completely different from a real elf, and were like beautiful foreigners with blonde hair and blue eyes. Somehow, Kenjiro could not believe the adults who spoke sternly of the elves, saying that the enemy nation's spies are disguising themselves as elves to infiltrate. If it were just imitating their long ears, then, well, that might be possible, but he couldn't believe that a human would be able to mimic the otherworldly spells and techniques cast with their staffs. Kenjiro pretended to be searching for edible wild plants and rapidly entered the forest that the local children feared and did not go close to. It was there that he met a cute young elven girl and became friends with her. She said that her name was Hachigatake Tsubaki. The elves used the name of their mountain as a family name and then would attach the name of a plant to that. Kenjiro was fascinated by Tsubaki. His prejudice about the savages living in the forest by the countryside village being the same as those dodgy characters was soon swept away. Tsubaki's appearance and gestures were similar, yet dissimilar to those of the noble wives that lived in town. He could understand that they had a completely different kind of a refinement to them. After seeing the elegant and graceful Tsubaki, all the girls that were the same age as him seemed completely childish. When he said that, Tsubaki gently chided Kojiro, saying that, even if I look like this, I'm going to become 50 soon, so you mustn't compare us. The way that elves and humans aged was different. Even though she looked a bit smaller than someone the same age as himself, Tsubaki was actually about the same age as his own grandmother. Nevertheless, Kenjiro still found himself attracted to Tsubaki. Tsubaki taught Kenjiro how to play a leaf flute, how to create a boat made of tree leaves, and how to discern ripe fruit from unripe fruit. On hot summer days, they would strip naked and play together in the waters of the forest's mountain stream. Kenjiro burned the sight of Tsubaki's beautiful body as she frolicked with the fishes under the sunlight that filtered through the trees into his eyes. When Kenjiro gave a bit of what little sugar he had been distributed to Tsubaki, she delightedly gave him a traditional elven baked pastry in return. Just eating one of those baked pastries filled his belly so that he wouldn't have to eat anything else for a whole day, saving Kenjiro, who had been feeling hunger when he was both awake and even when he was dreaming. And then, those glorious memories of youth passed in the blink of an eye. With the war having ended, evacuating was no longer necessary, and thus Kenjiro had to return to Tokyo. 
Kenjiro exchanged his most valuable spinning top with Tsubaki's small knife, and they parted tearfully. The small knife that Tsubaki gave him was used solely to sharpen his pencils, and it would be ten years after the war when he was studying engineering for university that he finally realized its value. Tsubaki's small knife clearly had the mark of a dwarven artisan. The dwarves that had been merely a legend up until the 19th century once again appeared in human history when they bumped into one of their underground towns when digging a tunnel deep into the earth. Every single article that they made was of high quality and were incredibly popular. However, due to concerns regarding thieves, robbers, and fraudsters, if they carelessly spread their works around, their prudence caused very few of them to appear on the market. Depending on the work, a single sword was valuable enough to build a whole house. Since long ago, it was said that the elves, harpies, mermaids, and werewolves had trade with the dwarves, but it seems that was actually the truth. After graduating from university, Kenjiro took part in a job related to ships, and through many twists and turns, eventually started to work as a crew member on a ship setting off to explore the Antarctic. Before setting off, Kenjiro utilized his long holiday to go to the forest by that countryside village for the first time in 15 years. Tsubaki, who welcomed him, had hardly changed at all. As Kenjiro had grown taller, his point of view had also become higher up, and as such, she felt even smaller than she was in his memories. Tsubaki, who had seemed so adult-like when he was young, was but a small child. With Kenjiro having become an adult man, it was even more apparent now how the flow of time between them was different. As they went fishing in the mountain stream together, when Kenjiro talked about how this time he was going to be heading to Antarctica, Tsubaki's eyes brightened up and she bit into the topic. According to the elven legends, Antarctica was where their creator was. Their creator was a mountain and had lived since the beginning of Earth itself, becoming Ning the founder of all the mysterious races on this Earth and had watched over the prosperity and decay of all life. What the Antarctic exploration team had found was probably that sacred mountain. Kenjiro hit the nail right on the head after hearing what she had to say. He had previously read a thesis that stated that after studying the geological layer at the base of the mountain, it became clear that it was an incredibly old mountain. The elves could not live if there wasn't a forest around. The fact that they worshipped a sacred mountain said to reside in the most cruel of environments, enclosed in Antarctic ice where not a single tree could grow, was an incredibly strange story. The sacred mountain in the South Pole still had not been climbed to its summit and was said to be the last unexplored region on Earth. Like the elves, it was filled with mystery. After promising that if he had the chance to talk to it, he would tell the sacred mountain, Mountain Dragonens, that Hachigatake Tsubaki was praying to it every day, Kenjiro returned to Tokyo. As he packed for the trip to the South Pole, Kenjiro thought to himself, the mysterious races that called themselves children of the mountain all had a single commonality in which they spoke of and respected Mount Dragonens. If Mount Dragonens equals the sacred mountain in the Antarctic, just what was it? Humanity had still yet to figure out its true identity. The 20th century was the era of science. Humanity would surely travel across Mount Dragonens soon and dispel that mystery. Kenjiro eagerly thought to himself, let's add my name to the bottom of that list of explorers. Chapter 16. End. The name of the sacred mountain that sat in the center of the Antarctic continent was Mount Dragonens, according to the legends of the children of the mountain. Mount Dragonens' elevation was 1-200 meters above sea level. It was far above the second highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest, which was 8,848 meters, exceeding it by 2,352 meters, and was the mountain that held the highest peak in the world. However, like how Everest had another name, Chomalungma, Mount Dragonens also held another title. That was the Mountain Range of Madness. Mountain Dragonens had a clear line that differentiated it from all other mountains, and was certainly a crazy mountain. First, the fact that the dwarves that should have loved the heat and hated the cold would loiter around the base of the mountain, which was enclosed in permafrost, while holding dragon crystals tightly instead of hot water bottles, was strange. 
only government agents from each country were allowed to trade and come into contact with the legendary races. And at the base of this mountain, they were as common as weeds. On top of that, the Dragosauruses that were completely extinct on all other continents created herds in the snow-laden mountains and were wandering around. It seems that they used penguins, earless seals, and various kinds of birds as food. The dwarves who tamed the Dragosauruses, who should have been extinct in the South Pole, used them as mounts, generating a scene that was so strange it felt like you could go crazy just from seeing it. It was not just the dwarves. The other children of the mountain, in other words, the mermaids, werewolves, harpies, and elves, were there too. When the mermaids found the ships exploring the Antarctic as they toured its coastal waters, they would without fail amuse themselves. There were even times when they would board the ship. One mermaid stayed on one of the U.S. investigative ships for so long, they went all the way to the west coast of the U.S. and eventually ended up living there, becoming employed as a member of the Coast Guard. It did not make any sense at all. The pack of werewolves that lived in Mount Dragonen's region was the largest pack on Earth, exceeding 10,000 in number. The pack in the North Pole had 500 werewolves, while the pack on Everest was just under 100, so it was quite apparent that it was far more numerous. The harpies also made a nest on Mount Dragonens, creating a gigantic flock. The harpies rode the wind, traveling and living all around the world without making any settlements. Since they were constantly on the move, it was impossible to get a precise number, but their numbers likely exceeded 30,000. Many of the harpies had survived through the era of pioneering in the West on the North American continent, and mimicked the gunmen from that time, threatening the Antarctic exploration parties and chilling their hearts. The fact that even the elves, who shouldn't have been able to survive if there wasn't a forest lived there, was completely incomprehensible. However, after the exploration team was led by the elves into the underground world of the Antarctic, while they were able to understand how the elves could survive, their brains rejected that comprehension. In the underground of the Antarctic that was covered in a thick layer of ice, magma provided a source of light and heat, creating an underground world overflowing with greenery to spread out. The day that this fact was announced to the world together with pictures, it could be said that the number of sci-fi novels that were torn up and thrown away were enough to make up a whole library. The underground world made human history look like a sandcastle in comparison with its enormous compilation of data. Treasures offered to Mount Dragonens by the children of the mountain over time existed, with the oldest one being from around 4.6 billion years ago. There were living witnesses to that history, the history of Earth that humanity had spent investigating for a few hundred years, identifying fossils and digging up stratums of Earth step by step was easily spoken about lightheartedly by them, reminiscing about the past, overturning everything. Mount Dragonens was a mountain that destroyed humanity's common sense. And then in the end, humanity managed to set foot on the moon sooner than they were able to reach the world's highest peak. The top third of Mount Dragonens could not be climbed without an oxygen mask. Geographically inexplicable strong winds became blizzards that constantly raged on, preventing mountaineers from conquering it. However, miraculously, if you declared midway through that you were giving up, the blizzard would stop instantly, and one of the children of the mountain, who had heard a divine message, would soon come to help you. They would come running faster than any mountain rescue team. The ones who died would only be those who made faulty judgments, refusing to back off. Now then, in 2003 AD, there were exploration parties that sought to climb to the peak of Mount Dragonens, which was said to be a place on Earth that was farther than the moon. During the 20th century, humanity was not able to reach the peak of Mount Dragonens. These exploration parties burned with ambition, seeking to complete the first biggest exploit of the 21st century known to the world. Already, several teams had challenged the peak and been defeated. However, on the eighth campaign of America's Hillary team, things were completely different compared to all the other campaigns until then. The Hillary team was a skillful exploration party and had grasped a route to climb Mount Dragonens 
and did maintenance on it up until their seventh campaign. They trained themselves to be able to avoid the intense weather changes that seemed to happen on a whim. The Hillary team's physical condition was perfect, and while a number of them gave up midway, not a single person died, and they crawled up to a point where they could see the summit. The Hillary team passed the line of ice statues of those that had exceeded their limits and died, which stood before the summit. It was thanks to the state-of-the-art mountain climbing equipment they possessed, their well-trained bodies, knowledge, and luck. After passing the ominous line of ice statues, the Hillary team suppressed their straying thoughts, taking a whole night before they could completely get over it. And on the next day, a female dwarf carrying a splendid hammer suddenly appeared and followed after them with unsteady steps. They thought that she had come to pick up someone who had declared they were giving up, but it seemed that wasn't the case. This was an incident that had never happened in all the previous records of mountain expeditions. She simply named herself Sahela and would at times tilt her ear towards empty space and say something in the dwarven language. Speaking towards empty space was a peculiarity of the children of the mountain who lived on Mount Dragonends. According to the people themselves, they were listening to the voice of the mountain. But no matter what tools humanity utilized, they could not observe that voice. While curious about the mysterious dwarf that followed behind them, the Hillary team pushed themselves forward, squeezing out every last bit of energy as they advanced forward. And on the noon of that day, they managed to pierce a flag with stars and stripes on the summit of Mount Dragonens. The Hillary team shed tears while hugging each other happily. The sea of clouds that could be seen from the tallest place in the world had an incredible beauty to it. Sahela will lend this to you. Neil, you, take this. The head of the Hillary team, Roderick Hillary, who was trembling with deep joy, was told that by Sahela in broken English as she presented to him her own hammer. Roderick breathed in and turned around to his team members. The team members were surprised, but excitement at the wonder of what exactly was happening sparkled in their eyes as they nodded. Roderick kneeled as he was told and received the hammer. The hammer was incredibly heavy, and Sahela shook as though she wanted it back, but she reluctantly allowed Roderick's hand to seize it. When she did so, Roderick heard a voice in his ears. Though rather than his ears, perhaps it was his brain or his soul or even his heart within which this mysterious voice sounded directly. Hey, humanity, congratulations. I decided since way back that the first one I'd talk to would be whomever reached my summit first. It's been 4.6 billion years since I last talked to a homo sapien. Well, why don't you sit and we can talk? Please listen. The story of Mount Dragonen's Mife is a long, long one. Translator comments. Well, with this, the series is over. Thanks to everyone who read this far. I certainly did enjoy reading translating about this crazy alternate universe with all five races and Mount Dragonens. I hope all of you enjoyed it too. For the time being, I won't be picking up any other series, and I'm going to try focusing on CSWH. Admittedly, Mount Dragonens really captured my interest, so I haven't been working that much on CSWH lately, and haven't really been able to make a proper backlog for it. Hopefully I'll be able to remedy that. Teehee. Stay safe, everyone, and I hope you'll continue reading my translations in the future as well.